the former prisoner and inmate. <laughs> Going straight to the sky, let me see you put your hands up. Cause we do till we die and we on another level. I'm at New York City. Got a piece of the pie, told you once, told you twice, that we only got one life. On the way yeah. to achieve success after prison, he's gonna share his story with us right now. Diamond shine. What's up, Street Pete? <laughs> I'm on the road heading to my dad's. He lives about an hour and a half away. I'm about half an hour in, so I got an hour. I figured, you know what? Let me uh, tell a story. I was just thinking about some. Yeah, you know, I'm always thinking about some, some kind of story. That's what I do for a living. I uh, as a writer, and, and and you know, now I own a publishing company too. Part owner of a publishing company. And what I do at that publishing company, I am the storyboard editor and line editor, and I help people uh, who are developing stories for books or scripts. Uh, ironically enough, looks like I just got contracted today to write the script uh, for a movie based on a book, uh, a Russian author, which is pretty cool. And so, He's paying me good money, and um, he's read some of my work. We spoke several times. He's like, "Yeah, you're the man for this, man." So I'm like, "Yeah, yes, I am." <laughs> Big chunk of money. It's like basically, he just paid my bills for the whole summer. It's a lot of work, though. Not, not crazy ton of work, but it's a month. It's a month, five weeks, four or five weeks worth of work full time, basically. Uh, but it's cool work, you know, it's work that I enjoy. You know, I enjoy writing and creating and it's a really cool story too. Really cool, I'm not gonna talk about it until I'm done, then I'll promote it. I am ghostwriting a, a book for another woman whose story was recently on 60 Minutes. Um, her father was called, is known as the Salt Creek Monster. Yeah, uh, he's like a, this backpacker rapist uh, attacker in Australia, a very famous case. Uh, it's been on all, all over the major news channels all over Australia. You know, you know Australia's a big market, you know, huge continent. And she, I think she was referred to me by somebody who read my books. And she started following me and she said, you know, what would it cost to have you write my book? And I'm like, this? And in her case, I'm not getting a huge chunk up front, you know, several thousand dollars. But I'm taking 40% of the royalties because it's a big, famous case. And I'm hoping that when we publish the book, there'll be a large market of people in Australia or all over the world who are like, oh man, I want to read this freaking story, man. This girl's freaking dad was a monster. And so, and I'm telling it through a, from a unique perspective too, very unique. Like, um, she's got a unique perspective. I think she's got a little bit of a um, certain mental hurdle she's getting over. Uh, you know, in her mind, she still sees her father as her father. You know, this kind of loving, doting man, although certainly dangerous and, and not all there but she doesn't want to believe what you know he's done although I think she's come to terms with it and so this is the struggle of her book in her book how she struggles you know to come to terms with the fact that her father was this freaking rapist monster who's believed to have killed several people because they're they they were last seen with him and now they're missing you know women go crazy I'm writing her book too but um anyways you guys probably don't care about that, but that's what I do. So I'm always in the, the, the realm of storytelling, you know, that's what I do professionally. But I always think about my, so I, here's what made me think of the story I'm going to tell you, which I, the only reason I'm going to tell you this story is because I think it's funny. I've told it before uh, a couple times over the years, uh, at least once on my YouTube channel, but a lot of the people who will see this are new to my channel, and that, this particular story is buried 300, you know, videos back, they're never going to see it, it's not in the algorithm, no one's going to care. So I'll just tell it again. And the people who've already heard it, then don't listen. I, you know, like it. I have a handful of people who's been around from day one. There's also a handful of stalker, lurker, weirdos. They're like, they're they're super obsessed with my life, and 
anytime I post any video, they like comb through it to see if I said something that's inconsistent that they claim is a lie or maybe I said a detail a little off. And uh, you know, I'm, if I'm, I'm telling stories on the fly that are 30, sometimes 35, 40 years old, and I'm an old man, uh, I, 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 you know, I, time to time I do get a, a detail wrong. I often do change the names, sometimes places, um, of events and things like I will in this particular case to protect the identity of somebody who was murdered uh, I don't want nothing to do with that and I don't want to be in a room with the FBI going you know you said on a YouTube channel that you knew this certain guy was murdered and you never you know brought it to the attention of the authorities I'm like you know I'm gonna... anyway so that's the thing and um and the other thing is you know there's you're not going to find these stories in, a, in an FBI file or uh court document um i was never a made mafioso nothing like that nobody followed me around i mean there were times where the cops followed me around most certainly where i was on their radar i mean i got followed quite a bit and i was a known drug dealer and a known criminal so there were times where they they were on me um in my life and, you know, but these are the things if i started talking about them like the, the, the haters and weirdos go he's lying his mind is capping i'm like i was just on uh I recorded a, a, a show with Johnny Mitchell from, uh, from The Connect last fall in Detroit. And we are just running around Detroit talking about, you know, crime in Detroit and the neighborhoods, going through neighborhoods. And I shared a few stories about things that I did in those particular neighborhoods, you know, crime stuff, gangster stuff, drug stuff, whatever. And, you know, I don't really pay attention to comments ever because it's waste but but I, I scroll through and most people are complimenting or saying I like this guy he's funny or he's interesting but there's always some haters like he's capping he's lying I'm like I'm like this was my own life nothing in there is that remarkable to where it's unbelievable the only thing that I could think of when people say stuff like that is like well, I know I lived an abnormal life like I know the way I behaved and things that I did back in the day we're not normal, so I can understand why some of them, especially ones who don't get out and don't do nothing and never done nothing, especially people who aren't street guys, they weren't gangsters, they weren't drug dealers, they weren't thugs, they weren't banging, they, you know, to them it seems implausible. It's, it's, it's the things that are, there's no way, you must be lying, but, you know, robbing and stealing, robbing drug drug houses and getting in gunfights. And shit. That's what I was talking about on the show, about some of the stuff they did. And guys like, eh. And that's what made me think of this story. Because uh, recently I posted a funny video, a short, on YouTube, which uh, was funny because this dude come walking in into music and he like puffs up and he flexes, he's got tattoos on and he's flexing. And I said, that's the guy slap up in the club. And of course you get a bunch of trolls going, ah, sure, I would have slapped you up or that guy, sure, you slap, you can't slap nobody up, that old man, blah, blah, blah. And, it's like, and so you get a bunch of these they're young though. They're 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 guys that are you know 35, 30, 25, 20. They didn't. They can't even comprehend the world that I came from. So I'm gonna tell a story about the world I came from. My ears are popping out, making me look goofy. So maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I'm not hanging out. And especially like when I was in gangster mode. Like you know, when you, you tell somebody, yeah, I picked up a gun and went out on the hunt for a mark looking for someone to rob that night because I knew I was down 700 bucks in my pocket. I had a dope habit, bills to pay. So what do you do? Most people will go out and get a job or borrow money or go find some, or steal. That's a lot of, you know, crackheads and dope beans will do it. Not me, man. I grab the gun, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna rob a bank, I'm gonna rob a dope dealer, I'm gonna find a mark, I'm gonna go hang out in the strip club. This is what I would do. I go hang out in the strip club, sip one drink for two or three hours, sitting at the bar and wait for some guy who I've seen have money usually drug dealers sometimes just regular old you know lawyers and crap but they go in there with 10 racks and they're flashing the money that's what I was after squares and I had girls that were you know working with me you know but this is that's separate it's a whole nother video I talk about that in a whole nother video Oh, I had girls call me when there was guys in there with a bunch of money, jewelry, whatever, usually black drug dealers. And then me and my cousin would wait in the parking lot and follow them. And then we either bump or butt them and like get them to pull over and we jump out with shotguns and you know get them on the ground and take their jewelry and money. Or we tell the girls to bring them to Coney Island and then we bust in Coney Island with 
crowded restaurant on Gratia in the ghetto, and we just run in there, masked up, and, and get them for the jewelry and money. They're they're always begging for the light. Please, man, I got kids. Then I shut up, mother. I blow your head off. And like, All right, here, here's the jewelry and the money. You know, and they want to live, so naturally they're like, okay. And they, so they lose ten grand. So in jewelry and money, they just, you can make it up. That's what I tell them. I said, man. You better shut the F up, man. You're going to make it to another day, man. You can make this money up, man. It's easy. I pull the trigger. It's game over. They got it. But that's what I would do. I got to the point where I was in uh, players. I was doing this at a bunch of strip clubs. I'd rotate because you couldn't do it at all times. But at one point, a strip club manager named Jerry. I forget what's his name. I always forget his name. Anyways, anyone who remembers players from the east side back in the day, they know Jerry because he was the manager of players for like 15 years. Before him was Bruce. I was boys with him too. I used to sell steroids to him and I ran poker games in the basement while he was manager there. And so he would remember me too. Big steroid up my, my left. But, um, but anyways, Jerry says to me one day, Al, you got to knock it off. He knows what I'm doing in there. He figures it out. He's connected to a bunch of wise guys. In fact, the wise guy owned the place. A mob dude owned the place. A mob guy owned it through an Arab guy he put up as a front man. But it was the mob dude who owned it. And the mob dude had like a pimp working in there. This guy's name, I think, was Jeff. I actually knew the kid's nephew. Um, and Jeff was a dude. I think it was Jeff. Was it Jeff Gary, maybe? I don't know. I think it was Jeff. Yeah, he was a pimp. White dude, always wear a cheesy suit, flashy suit, long hair and a ponytail. And I was thinking about, I was going to, uh, I was going to rob him. I was going to freaking extort him was what I was going to do. Now, this is right when I moved back from New York. So, I needed a come up on the money. So, I was in the strip club. I was selling weed and steroids, but I wasn't making much. I was making a, a G week, you know, $1,500 a week. And it wasn't enough, to, you know. I wasn't using drugs or nothing, but... You know, I wanted a new car, I wanted a new ninja, I wanted jet skis, I went out. So, you know, thinking about ways to make money. So, and plus I hung out in this titty bar all the time. But I didn't spend money on dances, I never did. And I didn't spend money on drinks, I never did. I go in there, maybe order one drink, have dinner, you know, hang out, meet girls. I get numbers from chicks all the time. But that's how I got their numbers, man. I, I could do a whole video on, on, I've done videos, and I could do a whole video on just Mac and strippers and strip clubs, how it's done. Of course, by doing that, you're always going to get some haters going, oh, sure you will, but these are virgins. You know, 30-year-old dudes who never touched a girl or they haven't touched a girl since, you know, they were in high school and, you know, they, they, they busted a nut in 30 seconds and it was over. But like, dude, back in the day, I walk in there and I was famous for this with my crew. You pick out the chick, the dimes, bro, the diamonds of the dimes, and I get her number. How? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't simp. I wouldn't say, hey, baby, I'm going to buy you this and take you here and this. I'd be like, no, I'm broke. I'm a college student. I'm in college studying to be a foot doctor or something. You know, some bull crap. You know, make something up. And um, I said, but, you know, I can make you laugh and I make you come. And <laughs> this is what I tell them. And so, uh, I hope I, where the frick am I? I'm in this little freaking town. I just want to make sure I'm going the right, the right way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're you gonna have the haters are gonna be like, oh, sure, sure, this old dude talking to you. He's like, he was a big pimp and all that. I'm like, ah, whatever. So, but anyways, the dude Jerry said to me, Hey, you're gonna knock it off. I said, Knock it off, why? He's like, No, nah, I know what you're doing. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, Dude, the freaking, not the FBI, but um, some investigators, local PD, I guess, Detroit probably, you know, they put together these robberies. And it's it actually, this is a crazy story. I'm also tell you this crazy ass story. Um, I, when we, me and my cousin ran in on Coney Island and, and, and Jack, some couple of black dope dealers, right? Took their jewelry and their money. Probably, like I said, eight, 10 grand score, real quick. Split it four or five G's each. It's easy money. And literally, it's like a five minute deal. Well, it turned out that there were two Detroit detectives in the restaurant when we did it. No joke. They didn't budge, they didn't move, they didn't try to pull their guns and be heroes, nothing. They just sat there and like, didn't move. We had shotguns, you know what I'm saying? I had a shotgun, Johnny had a pistol. But I mean, they weren't trying to get in a gun battle in a, in a crowded restaurant with a dude who had a shotgun on some obvious dope dealers, you know what I'm saying? So they just sat there, but after they like 
walked over and interviewed the guys and said, we're detectives, yada, 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 you know, and, and they said, you know, where'd you come from? Well, the guy said, oh, we just came from players, the titty bar. Now, just recently before that, there had been a couple other robberies in that same Coney Island. So, somehow they put it together that, you know, it was the same thing, same scenario. Guys, guys flashing jewelry money, came in, two dudes ran in. And so they put it together. These dudes are coming from the strip club. So they go to the strip club and, and run the surveillance footage. So we want to look at your surveillance footage and inside. They're not looking around. They're trying to piece together who was who. They're like, do, do any of these guys, do you know these guys? Do you know any of these guys are known, you know, stick up kids or robbers? Do you know any of these girls are setting up drug, drug dealers or guys or whatever? Of course, Jerry's like, no, 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 I don't know nothing. But of course, he's thinking of me. He's like, oh, no, you know. So, again, he knows I was connected. Not, nothing major, but he knew I was connected. He my Uncle Pete. He was friends with my Uncle Pete. That's how I knew the dude. You know? They were the same age. He was probably 12, 15 years older than me. He grew up with my Uncle Pete in Gross Point. And I think he did, anyways. And they were friends. I don't know how they were friends, but you know, they seemed to be very close. And uh, so he just said, hell, man, you got to knock it off. You can't keep doing that in here. I'm like, you know, like, all right, bro, bro, which I didn't know. You know? I like, yeah, just be cool. So I went to other titty bars and did the same thing. But that's the kind of guy I was uh, at the time. It's not funny. Uh, but desperation calls for desperate measure. In my mind, I was desperate. I, I mean, that's how entitled I felt, like in the river, and I got just trout in there too. Um, but I didn't want to work. Who wants to work? That was how my mind was like. I don't go to freaking work. I just robbed someone. That's how mentally ill I was. That's mental illness. So the, for the so the twits were like, oh, he's capping. He's this. He's lying. I'm like. You have no idea because you've never been there. You don't know that world. You don't know what those feelings are like. You have no idea. You know, don't know what it's like to grow up in an environment where there are criminals all around you and you're observing this and they're respected and they're revered and they're looked up to and they're treated with you know awe and respect. And you're like, huh, these are criminals. So in my mind, I'm like, you know, it's okay to be a criminal. It's okay to do criminal stuff in my defense. This made me do things to kind of emulate certain mobsters and gangsters and people I was around. And I, naturally, another thing that the dweebs will never understand is when you when you behave like that and that is how you act and that's your world, you attract other people who behave like that and that's their world. Normal people aren't going to accept you like that, even though I was good at hiding it. You know, I was, I was good at hiding it to, to a degree around people, like my normal high school friends and stuff like that. But even they knew, man. I mean, they'd see me go from zero to 100 in like five seconds. They'd see me just get up and knock a mother effer out. They'd see me pull guns. They'd see me rob. They, they you know, I'd talk to them about it, you know, sometimes. Like, yeah, I freaking hit the score last night. I robbed this dude, you know. It made me think of a whole other story about a dude I robbed in the strip club, after the strip club. The one my cousin Johnny shot him in, in the leg that he set me up. I was just the driver. I didn't even know he was planning to rob the guy. Anyways, it's a whole other story. I'll tell that maybe on the way back. So, um, Man, just had me thinking. And that, that's a crazy story. I should tell that since we're on this subject. I'm just going to tell it. Remember the other story about the after hours club in a minute. So that's the type of place I was in, you know, in my 20s. I didn't have, uh, I had no sense, uh, no value. I, I didn't have value for human life. Cause, like I didn't want to hurt anyone. I didn't want to kill anyone. I didn't want to hurt anyone. I definitely never wanted to hurt anyone. I was, I was praying that you know, this would never go bad. Like, a guy wouldn't pull a gun and start shooting. And that happened a couple of times. You know, I've been in a bunch of gunfights. You know, seven times. Seven times I've been in gunfights. You know, they aren't like major battles, but you know. We exchange gunfire, so it is what it is. Um, and you know, hopefully nobody was killed. I'm, I, I have a feeling I, I, I shot a couple guys. Hopefully they live. Um, I was shot twice, both in the legs. One time had nothing to do with anything I did. I was the wrong place at the wrong time. I was only 15 at the time, walking out of a wheat spot in Mount Clemens in the ghetto. And some dude started shooting. I caught a stray in the leg. But um, 
but the other time I was robbing a dope dealer for a quarter kilo of heroin. So, my mind at the time was so warped and gone from just kind of growing up around with my uncle, hanging around my uncle, and hearing these guys talk. That's the thing, you know? Come on, Alonzo, let's go down to the market. Let's go see my boy here, my boy there. And they all own like nightclubs or little like, like little sports bars or, or social clubs, whatever you want to call them. And I go in there and hang out with them and listen to them talk and shoot the gip. And you know, they all wear slick track suits and big gold chains, have a lot of money, hot chicks around, drive nice cars. So I obviously looked up to them and wanted to be like them. I actually emulated their how they talked and walked and acted because I wanted to be cool like them. I saw them guys as the cool guys, you know. They seemed cool to me, you know. And it wasn't like my grandfather and his, my grandfather was, I, I don't believe he was a mobster. He had connections to a mobster, was his cousins and his family. Possibly he was involved. I never saw him as a mobster, but he was around mobsters and I was around them because of him. I saw them pretty frequently and so, you know, at the house or in the market, at family functions, at church, wherever. So I, I know how they acted, and I, I didn't try to act like them, they're old men. But the younger men, who were like maybe my my uncle's age, those guys, you know, were kind of younger generations. They, they, they are the ones who, they didn't wear suits and crap like that, sometimes, but usually they didn't. They, they'd wear jeans and a, like a hoodie or something, or they'd wear track suits, and usually like track suits or sometimes suits. But that's how I ended up dressing because I wanted to look like them. And everybody I was around in like my grade school and stuff looked at me like, what the frick is this kid wearing? You know, they were wearing Turbo and stuff like that. Z Cavaricis. And I'm coming to school with a feel of tracksuit, you know, and a troop jacket. <laughs> and it was, you know, different. But, um, but whatever. I'm hoping I'm not. This cat can't, can't pass the beat. I'm actually almost there. It's crazy. I was flying. Um, so, going back to this robbery, one day, I'm on the east side. I don't know, it's 9, 10 o'clock at night. I can't remember what I was doing at the time. But my cousin, Yanni, calls me and says, Hey, oh, man, can you meet me on the west side at the strip club? I think it was 747. Could have been Landing Strip. I'm not entirely sure. Um... Oh man, I'm already at River Road. That was quick. Oh, I can't believe how quickly I got here. It seems like it went by fast. Um, so, it says, come meet me on the west side at this strip club. And I'm like, eh, I hate the west side. You know? Why would I go to the west side for a strip club when there's freaking tons of... You know, we got strip clubs on the east side, you know? We know some of the girls. We know the managers. We know the bouncers. You know, we know the owners. Why would I drive 35, 40 minutes to the west side? But he insisted. He's like, just come over here, man. I got this dude here, bro. He's freaking... So the dude had just won. I don't think he told me this yet, but he told me this after. Or maybe he did tell me, and that's why I went. I can't really remember for sure. It was a turkey. I don't want to hit it. It's like right on the edge of the road. Oh, it's a turkey vulture. He's eating something dead. Um, so the guy had just won a big lawsuit settlement. So uh, he won a lawsuit. I want to say it was like he worked at General Motors or Ford's or one of the big three, and he like hurt himself and he got you know, collected like a million dollars or something or several hundred thousand. So now he's at the titty bar flexing, you know. You know, so I, so I, my boy cousin says, meet me over there. So I drive over there. I'm all by myself. I think I was driving my Suzuki Grand Katerra at the time. It's kind of a. Suzuki SUV. It looks like a Range Rover. It was, it was done. It was a nice car. It wasn't super, not super fancy, but um, had a 15-inch kicker in the back. And it was, you know, it was tinted and rimmed up. It was pretty cool. But, um, so, I drive over there and walk in. I, I'm out of place. I feel out of place because normally when I go to these type of clubs, I know the dorm, I know the valet guys. I know the doormen, bouncers, managers, owners. I know everybody. And they know me. I don't pay no cover. I don't know nothing. I just walk in like, what's up, man? I knew everybody. They said, hey, what's up, bro? Hit them up. Give me a dab. Come in. You know? and they're like, hey, boys over there in the corner or wherever. That's how they treated us. They treated me and my crew with high-level respect. And it wasn't because we were in there selling, like, popping bottles. We weren't. We weren't in there throwing money around. We never did that. A couple of times. 
remember when my one friend's birthday, we you know we spent a couple of G's in there, but normally we didn't. That wasn't us. All these other lames in there were in there spending money. That's how we got the girls. We were like, nah, we ain't throwing no money down your pants, and we ain't getting no dances, and all that. that ain't us. Them some suckers. Go get that money from them lames and them simps. That ain't us. But we were all kind of good looking guys, kind of muscle bound, workout guys, fit guys, you know, good looking guys, street guys, you know, and the girls could tell them. I mean, they knew we were street hustlers. We weren't, you know, they didn't know that we were, you know, like I was a gangster. They didn't know I had any ties to the mob. Maybe some of them did, a few of them, because my one cousin, Dino, his girl worked in the in players, and uh, she knew the whole the whole situation, and uh, she ended up getting kicked out of the club one night, the titty bar, for hanging all over me when she was drunk. She had broken up with Dino, and she she was hanging on me, hanging on me, all drunk, and I'm, I'm like, I'm like, just get off me, man. She's a good looking girl, but my goodness, she's like, man, now I gotta freaking bang some chick that my cousin dated. It's funny, I almost banged another one of his exes. That's crazy. Wouldn't do it though. Shannon was her name, funny, I remember her name. But, um, so Jerry, the, the, the bouncer in there, I say, man, can you make her get away from me, man? And like, she kept coming back. So he actually sent her home. He's like, listen, get your, get dressed, get your bag, get the brick out of here, come back tomorrow, I'm like, you're, you're a mess, you're drunk. She's like, I need to make my money. I'm like, get the frick, you're not well, you're pestering the patrons, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I didn't like uh, going to the west side. I only went to the, the last, right before I got locked up, I went to the west. I'll get to the story, the main story in a second. But I, like, uh, again, this is, the only reason I'm sharing these stories is to uh, kind of juxtapose who I was. I want you to see who I was today. I'm going to tell you about my Christian radio station and life I'm living today. It's, it's nothing like that. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of fascinating and remarkable to look at how I was and then look who I am now and go wow man God really changed that guy's heart and soul that's the mission of this but anyways the last time I went to the, the right before I got locked up I went to uh, either the Landing Strip or 747 one of those two because those are the two main strip clubs on the west side by the airport with um, some big shops well what, you know, one of them was uh, uh, Frankie Scroy Jr. he owns uh, he owned Wild Woodies and Lipsticks, the two nightclubs. Or his father did, but his father died and left him. Now, I knew his father. That's how I knew him, through his father. I didn't really know his father well. He's an older guy. He's an old, wise guy. He's like a hustler, wise guy. Owned some nightclubs. Connected guy. Don't know to what level. Certainly was involved in the mafia to what degree. I don't know. But he knew me through my Uncle Pete all right? and his brother Joe. Because I knew Joe. Joe was a bodybuilder. worked out at the gym. Joe knew my Uncle Pete. I, I, I met him. We went in there and talked to him. And he introduced me. And for years after that, Joe Stroy was my boy. He's still alive today. He's an old man, but he's you know, probably still muscle bound as hell. He was like a Mr. Michigan back in the 70s. Um, and he liked me. He seen me knock a bunch of mother effers out in his club. Because he owned he, he owned the Ritz, which is the Palladium. I think he owned Skinny's too. Or uh, and another place on 10 Mile. I can't believe it. The Ritz was his main joint. Uh, they called it Club X on Saturday night, and I bounced for him. He hired me right when I came back from New York. I'm like, yo, I need to get, you know, I need to get in, I need a job, man. And he said, Al, that's like sending a fox to guard the chickens. When I told him I had a bouncing job, he's like, Al, that's like sending a fox to guard the chickens. I said, nah, bro, I'm a professional. I ain't gonna start no crap and da da da. He's like, you promised me, yeah. And I did. And I'll do a whole video on bouncing one day. One day I'll do a whole video and tell you about some, some of the funniest, craziest stuff that I did when I was bouncing uh, and at some of it at his club he was mad cool he loved me so but his, his nephew also his daughter tried to date me she was hot but she was a train wreck she was uh, drunk and coke and she was living out in LA she came back and she was all on me and Joe pulled me aside and, like she was all flirting with me and I think we went on a date and Joe was like hell don't do it I'm like what man he's like my, my daughter don't do it and I'm like, well, what's up? You know, what? He's like, you don't want that, man. She's going to be a drama girl. You don't want that. Trust me. Not to mention, Joe had met my girl not that long before because he owned the bowling alley next door. And next in the same building was a bowling alley. And I walked in with my girlfriend, Ramona, and uh, and he was, like, standing there. And I go, hey, Joe, what's up? And he goes, hey, who's this cutie? I was like, this is my girlfriend, man. I've been with her for six, seven years. And he's like, oh, nice to meet you. I said, like, this is Joe. He owns this whole you know, operation. He's like, oh, she's a cutie. You guys, everything's free on me tonight. And he gave us free bowling and free drinks. And free. And then, like, maybe, like, two months later, 
That's when I you know, went on a date with his daughter. And he said, hey, don't do it. But I remember going to um, the, the strip club with his nephew just like two, three weeks before I got locked up. My boy Brian Raper and another dude named Don Krupa, they're like, you know, you know, want to go with Frankie Stroy to the titty bar in the west side. I said, yeah, cool, cool. So I, and I normally didn't drive, but on this particular night, I did drive. Not sure why. I think Brian just didn't want to drive because he wanted to drink. He had a badass Jeep. I know you drive, my love. He's like, no, nah, I want to get drunk. I'm like, all right, cool, I'll drive. I hate driving, especially to the west side. But we drove out there, bumping, and we pull up, bumping, and we get out. And it's funny because the bouncer there, Wayne, who was, did, I don't know, he was in prison for like 10 years for murder, but he's out now. He got out, so God bless him. I hope he's doing good. Um, we got it. Me and him almost got into it one time, too, but that's a whole other story. But, you know, I just, this guy's home now, so I don't want a bad mouth. I'm not that scared, but, you know, I want somebody to be do good in life. You know, I don't want to kick up any drama. And I actually never had a problem with it. That's a whole other story. I can go deep the story there where it, it, the steroids got to his mind, and he thought I was messing with him. He called my house looking for my cousin Joe, and he thought I was pretending to be Joe, and I wasn't. I just said, you know, what's up? What are you guys doing? He said, what are you doing tonight? I'm like... I'm going out with Gino and the guys. You know, what are you doing? He's like, oh, what are you doing, man? Pretending to be Joe, bro. I like, nah, bro. He called my house and asked me what I'm doing tonight. I'm telling you. He thought I was pretending to be Joe, you know, my cousin. And he got all mad. He said he's going to come over there and beat my ass. So I told Joe, hey, if he comes over to beat my, man, my ass, I'm going to shoot him. And, and so I went in the basement where my bedroom was and loaded my shotgun. And I heard the door open like 20 minutes later, boom, bang. I hear him yelling, going, where's that little mother ever at? Because these guys are all huge, monster steroid guys. And I was like this little 19 year old. You know, I was a muscle bound bodybuilder, but not a huge. These guys were monsters. And Joe says, You know, you go down there, he's going to shoot you, bro. He wasn't messing with you. He wasn't pretending to be me. He's dead. He wasn't trying to, nothing. And he's like, He just answered the phone. And he's like, Oh, he's like, acting like he was you on the phone. And I was like, No, he wasn't. But if you go down there, he's going to shoot you, bro. So he's like, Can you shoot me? You think he's going to shoot me? He's like, Yeah, I'm telling you. I know him. You go down there, you'll see. Now what? I shoot him in the leg. That's when you know, blow his freaking knees off. He did. And so anyway, we came cool years later. But anyways, at night that we went to the strip club on the west side, he was bouncing uh, there. And we all sit down at the table. And I remember Wayne he didn't like me, really, you know, because we almost got into it at, at, the, at Tycoon's, another strip club, over my boy Eli, because I was going to beat his ass. And Wayne didn't want me to beat his ass. And I said, I'm beating his ass. You can't do it. And he says, don't make me do this. And I said, do what? Because I thought we were going to fight him. We're going to fight me over this kid? He said, don't make me call the cops. I said, call the cops on me? I had warrants. So just, whatever, bro. And I left. I could not believe it. He said, I'm going to call the cops on you. It's a big old mother ever. I get it, though. I had a reputation for being a lunatic, you know, with a gun and all this stuff. But anyways, that night at the strip club, he was, years later, he was, uh, walks off and he like gives me a massage on my shoulders he goes what's up fellas i see you brought the riff raff with you talking about me the, she's saying is the frank scroy this high roller who owns these nightclubs i'm with don cooper and brian raper and uh he says ah what's up fellas i see you brought the riff raff in or something and he kind of laughs you know i just take it as he's just busting balls but he walks away and don cooper goes i don't think wayne likes you I like I, like i take that serious i like Man, I don't give a F if Wayne likes me. F Wayne. F can suck a D. I don't care. You know, this is what I'm saying to him. And, and, and Don, who's a big muscle bound mother after too. Pussy. Big pussy. He's like, ah, oh, I won't talk to you about Wayne like that. I, mean, I should have said that to his face, man. Pussy. You know, I'm just so scared of the guy because he's big. I give a crap. I mean, I've seen him slap around like five drunks who are like half his size. But he doesn't. I'm not intimidated by that dude even a little bit. So, I mean, yeah, I was. I was. I was intimidated a little bit. In fact, honestly, if I was going to, if we were going to go at it, I would have had to put it all on him. Like, I would have unleashed the whole fury on his ass, 100%, because he was a big giant mother. But then I saw him um, not that long after that, you know, about a week or two later, I was with the Eli dude, who's how he originally was going to beef. And uh, we pull up at Wild Woody's, we're getting ready to go in the club, and we see this big muscle guy in a tight shirt with some girls standing out front. I'm like, who's that freaking guy? He's all ripped up, man. You know, well, Wayne had been uh, was a bodybuilder, and he was dieted down for a show, so he was all ripped up. Normally, he was huge. I'm like, who's that freaking dude? Like, we didn't recognize him from, you know, 
50 yards away. And then as we start walking in, he's walking out with these girls and he sees us. He's like, what's up, boys? And he like, gives us a hug. And I was totally cool. But I know he was in shock because I was with Eli. And Eli's the dude that he stopped me from beating up a couple years before. And I got into it with him at the Dort Players. I mean, Tycoon. Which is kind of funny, you know what I'm saying? But he, was, he kind of looked at us like, what are you, what are you two motherfuckers doing together, man? I thought you guys hated each other or whatever. So anyways, the dude that... I, that was the night at the, on the west side. We ended up leaving. I, don't, I can't even remember that night after, after with the, the Frank Scroy situation. Fast forward, going back in time to when my cousin Rob had shot this dude at a strip club, after a strip club. He called me there. He said, come in, come over here. Like he said, I need you or I want you here. I got some favor or whatever it was. And I get there and he's got this drunk, like dweeb square dude, right? And the guy's got a freaking knot of money like this, man. Just a knot of money. And he's like, what do you want, bro? Anything, I'm buying dinner. Everybody, who wants dinner? I'm like, it's like a steak, man. Steak and pasta, whatever. So he's like, everybody order steak. So he orders, everybody at the table, like five of us. He orders steak, pasta, drinks. Bottles of wine for everybody, champagne, drinks, whatever. You know, dude, like my cab, probably like a hundred bucks, and I'm not even barely drinking. You know what I'm saying? He's partying, it's so it's, we're just hanging out, busting balls, laughing, hitting on strippers. This guy's throwing hundreds at these girls, and I'm like, I'm like, that's when I said, Johnny, I'm like, who is this dude? Like, what's his deal, man? He seems like a square. He's like, yeah, man, he just hit a freaking big score on a on him. I want to say it was a, a settlement, but it could have been the lottery. One of the two, he got a big thing of money. It could have been lottery, but I think it was a settlement, like a legal settlement. So he's like, yeah, he's all having fun. Right, good for him, man. God bless him. Well done. I was like, wow, how come I can't get so lucky? You know what I'm saying? Man, I'd love to hit a big score so I don't have to do robberies and scams and sell drugs and run from the police all day and night, and hide and look in the rearview mirror all day, worried about going to jail. It's just my life. So... Anyways, about one o'clock, we had some drinks, fun, busting balls, whatever. Johnny, whose boy is there, who I don't know, I don't recognize the dude, I don't know the dude, which is kind of weird, because I said, who's this dude? He's like, oh, it's my boy I grew up with. I'm like, like I, I grew up with you, bro. I like, I, you know, what was that? I grew up with you. I know all your boys. I don't know this dude, you know what I'm saying? Because they, they went they went to Girls Point. They lived in Girls Point. And I didn't go to Girls Point with them, schools and nothing like that. But I knew a lot of his friends, most of his friends. I, I hung around them from time to time. I didn't know this dude, so I thought that was weird. He says he gets a he gets a call and he's like, "I gotta go, bro." He's like, "Actually, he's got a call." He's like, oh, "I gotta go. I gotta be back." He sold coke, not big coke, but like you know, maybe three, four ounces of coke at a time. And so he's like, "I gotta go." I'm like, "What's up?" He's like, "I gotta run back to the east side. I got a freaking you know customer waiting." I'm like, "He's like, do me a favor. Can you drive this dude home?" And I'm like, "I mean, I guess." He kind of just sticking me with the guy, you know, this drunk dude with all the money. So I'm like. All right, bro, you know, yeah, that's what I got to do. Um, where's he lives? He, he's like Southfield. I'm like, man, it's on the way. I'll take eight miles. So if I hit the 75 to eight miles, just take boom right there. It's kind of the longer way, but no big deal. So I, he leaves with his boy about two o'clock and, you know, the club shuts down. I do remember when we walked out to get my car from Valet, the guy went to tip the Valet Parker and when he pulled out his knot of money, an uh, insulin needle fell out. Uh, on the ground, which I thought was because he was using heroin or something. But I asked my cousin the next day, I said, why does this guy got needles, man? Is he a heroin addict? He's like, no, he's diabetic. I'm like, all right, that makes sense. So, he, he, so I drive him home. He's drunk babbling the whole way. He's on the phone talking to some girl. He's making no sense. Completely drunk babble. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm, I'm like this freaking guy's a mess, bro. Like I, I'm like, where do you live, man? Get your daddy. He tells me the address, blah, blah, blah. We pull up. This is where it gets crazy. So I live in a nice suburb, Southfield. And, uh, and I pull up. And I you know, this is his house. Like, this is my house. He's barely coherent. And then he said, I said, all right, cool, cool, man. Well, nice meeting you. And I'll shake his hand. And he pulls out his knot of money and he goes to hand me a hundred dollar bill. He goes, for you, man, for you. I said, no, no, I'm good, bro. And I said, thank you for dinner, you know, and, and drinks. I appreciate it. You don't got to pay me to drive you home. All good. And he's like, no, no, take. He don't say no to take it. He just, he goes, Rah! and turns, throws it at me as he opens the door and walks out. Just throws the hundred at me. All right, cool, man. I'll take the hundo. And as he gets out of my car and starts walking away, I, I see movement in the rear view mirror. There's a van, a black van. It's parked behind, it might have been burgundy, it was dark. 
and two dudes jump out, two masked up dudes jump out of the car and run up and they freaking start yelling, get on the ground, mother effer, get on, blow your freaking head up, blah, 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 blah. And I recognize Johnny's voice. I hear his voice. I know it's him. So I freaking like, oh man, this is, this is a move. This is the whole play, I just set me up. So I just go to peel off and as I peel off, I get like a house away and I hear a couple gunshots. Bang, 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 and it flashes, see the flash, bang, bang, bang. Oh my goodness, he shot, he shot these mother effort. He shot this mother effort. And so I was freaking out the whole way home, freaking out. Part of me was like, please say they didn't actually shoot him. Part of me was like, if they did, make sure he's dead so he can't be a witness or testify. But, you know, I wasn't really thinking that. I was thinking like more please, you know, they were just trying to scare him and shot by him and didn't hurt him. And um, so the next day I go to my aunt's house about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I walk right in the front door. She's in the kitchen cooking pasta sauce. I said, where's Johnny? She, he, says, he says, downstairs with the, some, some butana, which means whore. And I said, what butana? His girlfriend? He says, no, some butana, which is insane. It's not his, it's not his uh, girlfriend. She says, baby, you want to eat? You hungry? I said, no, no, I'm good. I already ate. She says, no, no, sit down. I said, no, no, I got to talk to Johnny. I, said, I go downstairs. This mother after my dad's house is right up here, so I'm gonna finish the story right here. So I, I walk down in the basement. They got a beautiful house. They got like a two million dollar house, big McMansion, not a huge mansion, but it, it's compared to where I grew up, it was a mansion. And then mom's got a white Mercedes. He's got a brand new SUV Cadillac Escalade, you know, both white. He's a spoiled kid. Mom married a millionaire, and, and then mom married a millionaire, divorced him, took his money, then married another millionaire. So they're loaded. And, um, so she's beautiful. Anyways, I go in the basement. He's in there sleeping with this chick. I kick the bed, wake up, mother effer. He's, ah, I kick the bed. It says, get up, mother effer. And I like, just hit him. I said, tell this butana, get, go in the shower. We got, a, I need a minute alone. And she looks at me and she goes, who are you? I'm like, I'm his cousin. I said, go in the shower, go take a shower. He's going to take you home in a minute. Go take a shower. Who the frick are you to tell me? I said, listen, get in the shower. I need a minute with him. He's laughing at this point. I look at the on the on the nightstand and there's not a money, big not a cash, freaking stack of cash. And I'm looking at it, you know. And so she, and he says, go, go take a shower. I'm gonna go home. We're gonna go get something to eat in a minute. He says, she's like, All right. asshole. She grovels at me and she goes. I said, man, give me some of that money. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, some of that money, man. Give me some of that money. He said, what? I said, you think I'm an idiot, bro? You could have just told me what you were going to do, bro. You could have just told me, you know what I'm saying? You set me up like a punk, bro. You played me like I'm a bitch. You think I don't recognize your voice, mother effort? I said, and why'd you shoot him? I don't remember what he said. He just laughed. He's like, oh, I didn't kill him. I shot him in the leg. I'm like, why? Why would you shoot him? He's like, I don't want him to know we meant business. Mother effort, he's a drunk freaking idiot. He could have just slapped him and went in his pocket and took it. He was a drunken moron. He was completely incoherent. You know what I'm saying? You had to just shoot the freaking guy? He's like, he's fine. I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. Anyways, give me some of that money. So he's, he, he, he grabs the money. He's in his underwear. He's not even in his underwear. He's naked. But he's got his blanket over his crotch because he leans over and out of bed with a blanket on his crotch. And he grabs the money and he counts down $2,000, right? He, he looks, starts handing to me. I said, nah, bro, keep it coming. I said, and if you ever do that again, I'll beat your head in, bro. I said, I'll beat your freaking, I don't care if your family, your cousin, if you ever do that again, I will straight up beat your house. come straight in this basement and beat your brains in, bro. You don't do that to me, man. If you're going to do that, you tell me. That's it. That's simple. Just tell me. You know what I'm saying? You know, we'll work it out. You're going to try and, you didn't want to pay me a, a, a cut. So you thought, you know, I can just set it up and, and hopefully Al won't figure it out and I can keep it in money. No, nah, mother effer. So he peels off another couple grand. He gives me four. I think he got 10, like almost 10 grand, like 90 some hundred out of it. Um, that was what he got. So the other dude probably got the same thing or some anyways. So he gave me four grand. And then I said, mother effer, you never ever do that again? I said, we're going to have a big problem. He laughed. We, we were laughing afterwards, you know, because I, I felt vindicated. I'm like, yeah, I got four grand out the deal. You know what I'm saying? It's not so bad now. But at the time, when I, if, if you didn't give me that money, I was actually planning on slapping him. I was going to slap him. Like, I was going to slap him in the bed. Just wham. I was mad. I was super mad. I was dead ass, seriously freaking ready to pound his brains in, man. It's just, come on, you're, you're trying to put somebody in prison, man. You know, I, being involved with a attempt murder, you know, not something to play with. 
anyways, that was where my mind was at and the type of people I was around back in the day. And so if you can't find that in a court document or a Fed file, I don't know what to tell you. If that's uh, something that you can't wrap your mind around because, you know, I've, I've lived a interesting or crazy or remarkable life if you can't wrap your mind around it i'm sorry i'm only here to tell this story for your entertainment and to say hey listen that's who i once was it's not who i am today all right i turn it around i can look back and at those times in my life and think wow man you know i cannot believe that was me and here i am today living this good life clean life i get to go fishing i have a great wife beautiful home you know i write books i'm at a publishing house you know, I got a radio station, Christian radio station. I'm doing all these things. And I'm like, man, that was who I was. <laughs> that was the guy I was before prison. And this is now the guy I came out. And this is crazy what God can do. It's crazy the transformation God can make. That's the purpose of this video. And entertaining, I get it. You know, some people find it, that those type of stories fascinating or entertaining. But I can't, I can't expect normal people to wrap their mind around it. So when some people, you know, hear it. The, especially like the, the the wannabe types they think you know they think because they you know always wanted to be gangster do gangster crazy stuff that it would be uh you know there's no way you could do something like that anyways my dad's here he's walking up so god bless we'll see you next time i'm out former prisoner and inmate <laughs> he did. uh what are you doing gun Wanna see you with your hands up? <laughs> Going straight to the sky, let me see you put your hands up. Cause we do till we die and we on another level. I'm at New York City. <laughs> Got a piece of the pie. Told you once, told you twice that we only got one life. On the way to achieve success after prison, he's gonna share his story with us right now. Diamond.